as happy as I can be Cause I am a turtle I'm friends with every single grain of sand in the world I live with a guy Who keeps me in his bath And only visits from time to time But how could I not let him win? single speck of dirt on the wall What's up, listeners? Hello. Hey. We're here again. Spine crackers. Matt here. Gabe here. Paul here. <laughs> and uh and we, Sean's here. Yeah, we have a very special guest Whoa. today. Uh a voice that all of you booktube people will almost certainly recognize. Uh we have Sean, the proprietor of the the, the uh fantastic YouTube channel and Instagram page, Travel Through Stories. Sean, how you doing? I'm doing all right. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here, man. When yeah. did you when did you start your channel? It's pretty recent, right? Um, I'm coming up on a year actually. Nice. Um, I think it was mid to late May, 2021. So, I feel like a, definitely you got a COVID bump. I feel like of like <laughs> new BookTube faces, right? Is that just oh, a misperception yeah. or? No, I think so like, for sure. Hey, yeah, because you 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 already have for a BookTube channel like what are you like one point eight k subscribers or something, something like that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just as baffled your, as anyone else. Yeah, what's your secret, John? Like, Why do you give us that's the like twenty thousand for normal YouTube videos? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're actually true. just gonna turn this into an advice. We just give us advice on how to be better at YouTube <laughs> for an hour yeah. and a half. So like I thumbnails that are cool or like what? I don't know. Dude, I, I don't know the. I, Don't I play no coy idea. with us. <laughs> no, I, I, I just uh, review obscure literature, and apparently, apparently that that sells occasionally. Um, I don't know. I could make unhaul videos or something, and that'd probably get way more views. So, what is uh, so an un, unhaul videos? Or is that just where people like throw away books? What does it oh, mean? Yeah, I don't right. Yeah, I don't really I know what it up, means. Yeah, yeah no, because like, a book haul where you yeah. buy books, and an unhaul where you talk about books you're you want to throw away. Weird. I don't know. What a weird. Yeah, that's a weird. Uh, I don't think I've ever watched one of those. No, I don't think I have either. It's very bizarre because they, the person usually just hates the books, so they're just like, "This is a book. I don't like it." <laughs> Should I do a book garbage. burning video? <laughs> book, book burn. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah that'll be fitting for idea. your characterization <laughs> throughout the podcast. I don't know. I I never get rid of books, even if I like, hate you, them. Wait, Paul, what are you? Nothing. That was a coy, a slight. Coy comment about caddy. Like, Paul's being caddy. It was caddy. I'm gonna need you to chill out on that. <laughs> okay. Or we're gonna have to be fighting amongst ourselves. <laughs> okay. I know. This is Paul just... thinks because he hit a couple heater backhands on the tennis court. <laughs> <and> just... <laughs> dude, Paul's, I had a couple. Paul's like, feeling his oats. Ones. He's feeling his oats right now, dude. Yeah. I feel like we're. I feel like working out right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my oats. Well, we're about to work out your mind and body or spirit not body not your body at all yeah <laughs> yeah uh because yeah so we're talking about a book today as we often do on the show <laughs> it's, uh we're talking no about surprise there no surprise there shocker we're talking about barley patch by australian author gerald murnane uh when did this come out 2011 something like that 2009 Nine? About 2011, I believe. I think, yeah, or at least that's oh, when it was, yeah. Here, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah it says 2009. Oh, right. oh yeah, 2009. Two, oh yeah, 2009 in Australia. 2011 oh. here. No, it's all good. Um, and Matt, who? This was your pick, right? Yeah. All right. Well, why did you pick this book? What's What's the vibe? Uh, I I picked the book because I, I and I don't remember who to attribute this to, but but somebody was like this. In particular, Barley Patch was like a, a, you know, before and after level read 
Like I like they were like this is like such a gorgeous, um, you know, life altering experience that I had reading this book, and I was just like, damn, all right, and I chose it, and and I also you know it was in rise with like Murnane's relative mainstreamization, uh, if you can call it that, uh, rel- you know, relatives at least speaking. Uh, as like somebody to pay attention to who was like neglected for a long time at least internationally and uh, some of the stuff was getting some buzz and it it, it, it had the meta kind of um, thing of like discussing r- writing about writing which I- I'm a sucker for and, mm-hmm. and always find it so yeah it just it, uh, it drew me in so I, I picked this he had a he had kind of like a booktube book bookstagram moment i feel like like last year or for la- la- you know the last few months at least where he was kind of people were talking about him a- a quite a bit right at least that at least on what i saw yeah i, I don't know. I see his name fairly often on like uh on twitter especially i'm not sure mm. about instagram but yeah i i i never heard of him up until um i joined twitter and instagram and then i feel like i saw him a lot at least disproportionately to, uh, um, you know, how much I heard, I, I heard of him before. Yeah, it's, yeah, he kind of had like a, yeah, it just kind of came out and everyone was, it seemed like everyone was talking about him and I had never heard of him yeah. either. Yeah. And you just did a video on the planes, right, Sean? I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was um, my second of his that I read. I read Border Districts at the end of last year um, and really had no idea what it was about. Uh, I, I finished it and just didn't know what to think of it, so I just put it aside and didn't think of it for a few months, and then I read the planes. Um, also, didn't really understand it as the video uh, shows. Um, nice, but yeah. So I'm I'm excited to read Barley Patch because this is kind of in his second half of his career, right? Kind of so, after he, the break. Yeah, yeah. He took like what, like a 16 year break or something like that, where he wasn't writing at all. Yeah. Um. Also, just interesting. The other superficial reason was just Dalky Archive put it out and. I have shout out some some faith in in them uh, as putting out good stuff, but yeah, this was this was after a fifteen year sixteen year dry spell, and and this book is in part like a kind of justification or kind of explanation to fans of his or uh, in a way like right here here's fan service <laughs> yeah it's just fan service <laughs> people were like pissed. No new updates or patches were dropping, and he was uh, <laughs> getting a lot of he was getting a lot of hate. Devs, he, dro- he dropped the barley patch. <laughs> yeah, it did, yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> Drop the barley. Oh, fuck. <laughs> it was right there, and I didn't take it. Yeah, that yeah. was great. Um, yeah, well, he, I was, had, he had some writer's block. Maybe, clean, clean. yeah, 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 or yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, that's part of what we'll talk about, I guess, in the book. So we'll see if. Uh, We'll see if Mernane goes three for three and being inscrutable for you, Sean. Um. <laughs> yeah. I have a uh, feeling it will be. <laughs> yeah. Ah, a little foreshadowing. Yeah, okay. spoilers. Um, all right, Matt. Well, what, like, so you mentioned a little bit about the book's sort of place, but, like, I'm and I'm going to stick you to the wall on this because it's your pick and you have to do it. What is this book about? <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll, t- I'll get that layup in. Easy. Uh <laughs> this might be one of the most difficult ones to do. Good luck. Well, I think I think uh, you know the question posed. There's like a real good quote at the beginning about like, you know, um, that whole idea of interrogating your motivations to be a writer with the question like, must I write? Like as an incredibly serious question, like a uh, will I die for this? Like that's how serious Rilke I think was taking it, and um, and so yeah, that's the sort of presiding question. Like why the fuck? Must I write? Why did I write? Um, w- kind of like, why do you read? You know, as like the ghost question in there. Um, and then it proceeds to be these kind of like snowballing vignettes and like scenes stitched together of um, like biography, basically, mixed with like purported fictions uh, that are uncannily similar to parts of Murnane's biography as well uh, as he through never directly addressing the question in, in a lot of ways like like, like attempts t- 
to make a case indirectly that he wants the reader to like participate in and draw inference from about why that 15 year gap of writing occurred and then why he Um, started up again right and then why he started up again yeah yeah i feel like this book it, it 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 is at least as much i mean i don't like talking about genre too much it's just kind of boring to me in general but is this like this book felt as at least as much like a personal essay and or autobiography than or like pseudo biography than than a work of fiction, which I thought was really interesting because that's clearly like part of Murnane's intent. But also throughout the book, he's constantly reminding you that this is a work of fiction, right? Going out of his way to to have his yeah. na- unnamed narrator remind the reader that they're reading fiction, which is this weird like. <laughs> I don't know. The language like performative so... contradiction between what the narrator is saying and what my sense of the actual reading experience was. The language almost becomes so weighted in in, in the attempt to like continually, per, like constantly and incessantly remind you of that. That the, it was a very like awkward reading experience. Like it, it almost felt like a technical manual in a way, like where you know everything or legal language or something where you needed everything needed to be clear and because he is so phobic of of kind of characterization or 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 misleading anyone outside of like his very specific vision for this project it has this legalese aspect to it where it's like everyone's called the personage and the image person and and this kind of stuff and like it it just reminded me of like girl cousin girl cousin (laughs) boy cousin (laughs) yeah just like the most like as well as he's able the most like kind of connotationless and yet capacious ways of describing things yeah i think yeah it seems like it's uh like the simpleton in me just wants to state that um i feel like a, a a big factor why the book was like difficult to read for me was that there was a very huge lack of any breaks you know it was it was it was hard to put down because like it's so meandering and kind of it's not exactly stream of consciousness because it is kind of it feels so clinical in a lot of ways Mm. but it jumps around and you never really get a clear sense of like oh i this is where i can stop for a while yeah there's only there's what two sections like two formal sections there's two sections it's airless yeah but that added to like the kind of uh the reading experience for me in a negative way i mean i don't think that it's always a detriment to me to have like no chapter breaks but um the pacing was very very like it was like reading through mud in a lot of ways you're <laughs> <laughs> <Girl>, a mud name <laughs> wait sean I, I so because you're the only person here who's got any experience with any other work I just need to like ask you if it, it, it uh, is any way similar or like how how it places and within the other two that you've read just because you're the only one with this expertise here. Hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, I you're mean, I, I think this, yeah, yeah. I think this goes <laughs> back to like the issue of genre that Gabe brought up that I don't know what to do with this novel because it's so unlike anything else I've read, period, never mind read by Murnane, in that he, it's clearly autobiographical in in some ways and it's very aware of its own constructedness in ways that um, his other texts also kind of are, but not to the extent that this is, right? In this, every like fifth or sixth paragraph, we get uh, the narrator butting in to say, while I was writing the previous paragraph, I was thinking and kind yeah. of just laying it out there. Um, I, th- I think it's similar. It's similar in this in this kind of implicit quest. This goes back to your, your kind of uh, summation, Matt, uh, the implicit quest of discovering meaning. What does this mean? Why? Why? Why do fiction? Why engage with fiction and either writing it or reading it? It must mean something. And there's something there in his other novels as well that he's always after on this quest to discover what the meaning is but he never really ever gets there it's like it's like he's always digging just beneath the surface right why do i remember this random me- memory of my girl cousin um and then he retells the memory <laughs> and you would think at the end there that you know he would discover why he remembers it but he doesn't quite 
And I don't know, yeah. there's like that like level of like mysticism there that that which is apparent should have meaning and it does have meaning clearly because he remembers it. But what is that meaning? He I, doesn't fully answer. Does, does that memory even have meaning just, you know, just because I remembered it and it feels yeah. like I it has meaning to me is that yeah, actually meaning meaningful mm-hmm. yeah yeah i feel like this gets to something that kind of was eating at me or bugging me about this book a little bit and i watched uh sean you sent me a video uh, uh, that of a talk that mernane gave um not about this book specifically but just his writing process and his his thinking about it and i and i was watched that and read a couple other things and it's it's it was interesting to me that like his his stated process or goal in writing is just it's essentially like Paul said it's not stream of consciousness but it's just what he calls to like accurately report the contents of his mind at a given time right like just kind of it's a very phenomenological like approach like I'm just reporting you know it's it's almost like a diary right like here's here's just what I was thinking at this time and it's interesting to me First of all, I think that that dovetails with the question of like meaning because like how to put how to put this just the just the the contents of anyone's mind at a random point in time are not automatically going to be particularly meaningful, right? It's going to be just a, sort of a random uh, uh, you know a, a, a amalgamation of memories and impressions and sense data and whatever. <laughs> And I feel like that comes through in this book um, for me, yeah, yeah. for me, uh, in in, yeah. in not necessarily a way that I enjoyed. I mean, I think that that question of you know is is meaning you know preexistent or is it made? Is it something that that we craft through these sort of initially random connections and things are, are granted weight as they sort of um, develop more like nodal connections in this matrix of random crap that goes on in our fucking brains. Um, (laughs) And I think Bernan is definitely engaged in that project. But the other, I don't don't, Well, the other thing I'll shut up after this for a second. The other thing that I thought was interesting is like, why ask the question, why write fiction in a book that is, has such a tenuous relationship to fiction? Like that, that is sort of almost nonfiction in terms of its autobiographical components. It's just kind of philosophical essayistic ruminations. Like it's like it, it's it is still not obvious to me that this book should be classified as fiction, or at least I think that's an open to some degree open question. And so it's interesting that he's asking that question, but not in a book that's explicitly fiction. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely agree, and. I mean, the way he writes his his like sort of lucid stream of consciousness thoughts about like inane details about what he's thinking, I ca- I couldn't help but think back to the mezzanine by Nicholson Baker, because he he did that, but he wrote it in a he he does it in a way that like he he's okay with the fiction aspect element of it, like he wants to add some beauty to it, and and discuss the uh, the issues of meaning and memory and what that all means, but he wants the reader to like appreciate that. And I, I got the sense that Murdane didn't really care <laughs> whether or not the reader uh, finds the writing beautiful or finds the, the stream of consciousness provoking in any way. I feel like it was almost like a, not a selfish act, but it, it felt like it was, it was very much f- like, I feel like this book was very much for him. I think, yeah, and I think the the fiction stuff, like, Gabe, like, just, I mean, not that it was effective or not, it was, but I think the fact of everything essentially, like, referring back to basically Murnane's own experiences and memories was, and why it's diaristic, was part of the idea. Like, you know, like, it is engaging with that kind of, that question we've we've encountered at this point quite a lot in uh, all the reading (laughs) of like uh what is you know what's the mixture of of fiction versus reality like in what ways do these things intermix and interpenetrate and that's why i think that was happening yeah i mean and i think you know it's it uh, i agree and i think that there's a lot of other it serves other purposes as well the sort of like pseudo fictive aspect of the text because the other thing that Bernain does throughout is you know not only reminding you that you're reading a work of fiction while producing one that doesn't necessarily feel that way 
is, which is interesting. But also, he does this thing, especially in the back, in the latter half of the book, where he's like, you know, because his other obsession is he claims to not have an imagination, to not be able to imagine, <laughs> yeah. to not be able to imagine anything other than just reporting immediate phenomenological experiential data, right? Um, which, of course, is... I, 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 like, he's such a weird, weirdly serious person that I don't know how serious to take him when he says some of this stuff. Because, <laughs> yeah. like, why one, uh, you know, one part of me wants to be like, this is kind of like a... You know, he's playing around because he claims to not have an imagination, but is obviously doing some imaginative work in these in this text and in his other texts. But then to hear him talk about it, like just all, like he seems dead fucking serious when he says when he's like, I don't I literally don't think I have an imagination. I can't imagine things. I can just report things. Um, and so the other thing he's doing because of that conceit of like, I don't have an imagination is constantly throughout the text being like, here's what these characters would be doing if I could have written the work of fiction that they would have been characters in. But of course, by just describing that, then he's just writing the work. And you know what I mean? Like it's so I don't know. I think that's interesting. Yeah, I feel like he 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 is very much imagining in the way that everyone else agrees imagination works, but to him, that isn't how it works. Because to him, he isn't the way he claims it, he isn't um uh, generating these images. He isn't generating these memories. He's just retrieving them. But I feel like that's what most most artists do when they say that they're using their imagination. Um, so I feel like he, I feel like he is kind of playing fast and loose with that term uh, in, in yeah. some interesting ways, but in some frustrating ways as well. Yeah. Yeah, his crisis I found, almost I found feels... The... Yeah, go ahead, uh, Matt, sorry. I was going to say his crisis almost feels like just an extreme dilemma caused by a very particular interpretation he has. Yeah, totally. And I, I mean, to, to go back to like your question, Gabe, or what you're saying about like his, his question about why I write fiction to begin with. I, just, I mean, personally, I just find it to be a boring question. I don't like books like this. I don't like any media like this <laughs> uh, to me. I'm just like, it, it's an, to me, it's an obvious answer. It's just like people like it. It it's just like you <laughs> consume it and it's good, you know. It's like you shouldn't dive too deep into it. <laughs> so, I mean, hell yeah. super valid. Um, <laughs> so to like suffer through someone's thought process about like some sort of crisis they're having about that notion, I'm just like, it, it kind of irritated me. I'm just like, right, right. Just who cares? People like it. Do it. No, I mean I think that's a, that's a, a a fair question, you know. <laughs> I mean, I I I do I like I think I like that sort of stuff more than certainly more than you, Paul. I probably like the the Goldilocks here in the middle where Matt loves that that meta self-referential kind of books about books stuff and Paul hates it. And I'm kind of like in the middle. It's fine. Like I, I, I and I know, I know, I don't know how, I know how Sean feels about this a, a little bit, but like at some point I just, I would just prefer, I'm just like, just, I just read literary theory, like just read Derrida instead of this, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And in this yeah. particular case, some spoilers, I think Derrida is just fucking more enjoyable to read. <laughs> I, I was just saying something. <laughs> well, I um, it seems it, like it's saying something to me. Yeah, yeah. He, well, I he's mean, he's like notoriously obtuse and sucks to read. And yeah, yeah. He's and so one. that's the the you know spoilers. Well, that because that's what Murnane feels like he's he's skimming onto is is just the you know it's all text kind of. Yes, absolutely. Know, it, it just just modes of interpretation that are that are endlessly you know the subjective like hermeneutic of your choosing and you can never leave the mind and therefore like what is an imagination like you know like what am i actually doing here like conjuring conjuring things ex nihilo and being creative and like the class i don't know some sort of like other definition or just having this uh almost puppet being puppeted by the feedback loop of my like biological system and my memories with my ability to like create patterns out of them and narrate them and, mm -hmm. and write them with the uh, language, which is its own complicated medium, which he almost feels like he's doing the kind of Wittgenstein quietism with that 15 year gap where he's just like, all right, I'm going to take a minute and actually figure out what the fuck I'm trying to do or what I mean or what I'm saying. Yeah. Mm hmm. 
Uh, yeah, so that's I mean, it, guys. That was a great episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. No, no, I, mean, I did I, want to say that I, I didn't. I didn't. I, I know that you, Gabe, you said that I, like I hate these kind of books and like. I, no, I just. You don't I don't. Enjoy. I don't necessarily hate the the not angle. Anyone fan. is. Com- I'm not a fan. I would prefer not to. <laughs> I will say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, I mean, all right, Bartleby. I'm thinking about <laughs> the other book we read that fit, fits into this genre. I would say is the Calvino book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I actually found. I mean, this was a confusing one for me because I found a lot of. Murnane's writing to like a few passages would just stand out to me and just be like and hit me really fucking hard and mm-hmm. like there was actually one passage kind of early on I was trying to find it about when he's talking about his girl cousins and he's talking <laughs> about like the relationship that I thought he was leading to sort sort of something like incestuous but he kind of does he kind of dodges it but he talks about he dances um, around it he dances he dances around, around it. it and there's like there's some clever use of language where he says certain words out of context that are just like sexual words that I found very clever, but he had already like moved on, you know, it, it was very writing, but he, he talks about um when he's a kid and he's like in a, he's like alone in a, in a barn with one of his girl cousins and he has many and he talks about the relationship between a cousin and he talks about the relationship within a family and an, op- an opposite sex member in, of your family and he explains it in such like a an interesting new way to me of just like someone who doesn't have that you, that you don't have that tension with because you're related so you you actually view this person differently than you do all of your other peers you know so it was actually it made me think about like cousins and family from a new perspective actually long story short the incest parts of this book really deeply resonated with paul yeah. <laughs> Shout outs to yeah. Ben. <laughs> the wrap up. Yeah. I mean there there is like because the language is like so dry, uh it is interest it is funny to me that how much sexuality feels like infused into like the entirety of the mm-hmm. book. <laughs> like like there's so much obsession over fictitious women, real women, uh real women re re-rendered as fictitious women and like uh it's it 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 kind of is seems to be one of the huge themes like there's so many just women that he that mernane in all of his different avatars is is basically like like gooning over (laughs) like uh, like ogling and 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 being an incel about and all this kind Mm. of stuff and uh it you know obviously like my first thought was like the kind of whatever the muse and like the uh you know the the creative element that women sort of represent abstractly and all this kind of stuff but well and he does have like a sort of muse like figure in his kind of like imaginative space there's this image for early on in the book that he talks about of like this this woman who's like lying at the bottom of a lake kind of like in perpetual stasis and as an image that he kind of keeps returning to and and survey serves as like a, a, a more traditional sort of muse in that way. Was that the glass spear or was that the myrrh something else? It wasn't the glass some... spear, I don't think. No, it was... it was it was a children's poem or something. Yeah, I, I can I'll try to find it. Sorry guys, somewhat yeah, one of us can maybe I... find it, but Well, I I did want to ask ask you guys about this because there's there is this I mean he says a few different times. Um, this this is just a really small two sent- or one sentence uh, passage on page forty seven, where he says that I read books of fiction in order to see landscapes in my mind and to meet up with young female personages in my mind. <laughs> so there is, in, in my opinion, this very like noble, uh, you know, desire to travel, um, and that's kind of why he he reads and why he writes is that's how he does his traveling. Um, through Renee. stories, travel, travel through stories. <laughs> I was getting there. Gotcha. This was all just a plug. <laughs> <laughs> but like, uh, like uh, Bernane in, in real life, Bernane, like he he famously has never traveled outside of Australia. He's only been outside of the state of Victoria, you know, a, few, a handful of times. And so this is a way that he he can travel. Um, but then he brings in this this constant uh, like quest to basically talk to girls 
Um, and he keeps coming back to it. And and there's a part of me that, that like that wants to read it as basically kind of like Matt said, like like incel, like fan fiction essentially. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's also because there's so much um, like religious imagery throughout this book, and mm-hmm. he grew up, you know, in a very um, parochial, uh, uh, like you know, pre um, the Second Vatican uh, Catholicism. Yeah. This very masculine, very um, segregated between the sexes world that he couldn't the only women that he spoke to were his aunts that he speaks very fondly of and his girl cousins that right. he also speaks very fondly of <laughs> but so there's like there's this desire that one of one of the reasons why he writes is basically to get laid in his mind <laughs> which i don't know what to make with that <laughs> no that's that's super yeah. i yeah. think that's totally true but and it's interesting because and i think this was also true of the real life mernane right he for a brief time, like becomes a monk of a type or some sort of, uh, you know, I forget the exact like order that he, yeah, 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 I forget the exact one that he jo- winds up joining, um, but but yeah, again, that religious stuff, and then of course the the connection between celibacy and like, you know, <laughs> there, yeah, yeah, there seems anywhere. to me like at, there seems to me like at, at like the core of this book to be to be this court of loneliness and like there's like almost like this fear of being alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one mm-hmm. of the things that kind of draws him or drew and, and we're kind of mixing or I'm, I'm at least mixing Murnane and the kind of implied author, as, as he would call it, of this book um, that, that drew him to uh, I was watching a, an interview with him. And he talks about how w- one of the reasons why he wanted to become a priest was because he. Well, he didn't know what else to do, and he thought that just being like a celibate bachelor was just his life. That was his only choice. He was forced into it. He wanted to graduate from incel to, to Volcel. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All of, the, incel, all of these might, new might attributes well about his personality. I didn't know any anything about this, but it's just making me making him appear more and more loath, loathsome to me. <laughs> to be honest, he's a pretty wholesome. Like you watch interviews with them, though, and he's. He's a very wholesome man, it seems, right? Like, and he, he's he's yeah, he's as kind of dull in a wholesome way as this book would make me imagine. Like, yeah. he's just like he in my filing cabinets, and uh, <laughs> I wrote, I wrote, uh, I have stuff with files, and uh, yeah, yeah. I don't put a lot. I've got room. my I've got my Antipodean li- 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 archive. Yeah, he's like. <laughs> I only use a typewriter because I don't like distractions. <laughs> and you're just like, damn, dude. Yeah. There is something like, uh, like almost childish about his like demeanor in, in interviews and stuff, mm-hmm. um, and just kind of the way the way he talks about this. But I don't know. I I, I found it kind of like wholesome. Um, it reminded me a lot of um, I don't know if you guys uh, like Carlo Vicenzgar, uh, but I, I love Carlo Vicenzgar. But it reminded me a lot of of his books, and that it's this this honesty of of desiring uh you know a a female personage to to be with <laughs> mm-hmm. um there, there's something so 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 honest about that that desire embracing the cringe but embrace the cringe man yeah yeah what are you gonna but do can, yeah i mean I, guard... I definitely agree i mean like i'm thinking about early passages early on where he's talking about like the school girls kind of laughing at him but in like a really particular way like laughing at them not not like burst out laughing at what he said but like they chuckle under his breath and it makes him feel even more lonely because it's not like a huge laugh it's just like they're just laughing him off almost yeah dismissive um, like they're very dismissive it's like, it's like a development of self-consciousness like right. happens there yeah you know, right it's like that first like oh i'm being earnest and then there's this reaction that i don't understand <laughs> which is sort uh, of like it you know it's like a it's like an adam and eve moment for him personally it's like the development of consciousness of the self and the body as something to be ashamed of or, or, or whatever. And I read somewhere, I don't think it's in this book, but he's really interested in, in the Bronte sisters, right? In this fictional world that, that they created. I forget, Ga- Ga- Galandal or something like Gondol that. I forget. Gondol, and then, yeah. Uh, and Galdine. Yes. Galdine, yeah. yeah. And I, I read Gal- somewhere that in some of his works, he has something akin to that that's called like 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 New Eden or something. And so I think that he's definitely interested in in this sort of connection. Um, I, may, I may be that may be apocryphal. I may be making it up. New Arcadia. No, that's the one in here. But there's another one somewhere somewhere else in his work. Apparently. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, I, I think that that's actually. I mean, I don't know that much about the Bronte sisters, to be honest. 
No, but, me either. I mean, that kind of, yeah, that, that kind of gets at like the heart of, I think, Barley Patch. I think at the, at the very, very end, um, not that we need to jump right to the end. Um, it doesn't matter. But he talks about yeah, yeah. this, this, this fictional world that the Bronte sisters, when they were young, um, created this, this land of, of, of Gondol. And then not only that, but within the land of Gondol, these, the people within Gondol imagined a second imaginary land called Galdine, uh, called Galdine. And so he is very much, um, I think he's very much drawn to the Bronte sisters because the Bronte sisters were also like very lonely and very, um, you know, separate from society that I don't know if, if, if like the, uh, you know, the crux of this is that lonely people turn to fiction because that wouldn't be, that wouldn't speak very highly of, of us four here. <laughs> yeah. But. Girlfriend. Read my bookies. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think there is, is something there to the, the, the background of our, of our narrator growing up in this very conservative um, Australia, this, this is very like suburban Australia as well. He's, he's very interested in like, in like the suburbs of Melbourne rather than, you know, the inner city life. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. This is just cause it's in the moment. Maybe this is too spicy and I should save it for the Patreon segment. Do it. <laughs> but, but well, just cause we were talking about the sexuality and all that stuff a second ago too. And, but I, I, and maybe this is a weird reading and I, maybe I'm projecting somehow in a way that is troubling, but I hope you are. Did, I hope you let's are. learn did, about, let's but, learn about Gabe right now. Did anyone, <laughs> did, did anyone else get the vibe at a couple moments that he was like molested by one of the ants? Uh, did anyone else that. catch like cat, get that vibe at all like there's okay there's one passage there there were a couple but like an idiot i didn't note all of them um but i i, I do have one here um if you have one strong one i'll, I'll i might buy this well it's <laughs> it's it's tenuous i'm not saying it's like a slam dunk interpretation but it, it, it there was just just because there were a couple that were weird to me so let me see here because there's a lot of scenes where they wind up alone together in weird spaces and like he talks about like as a younger child like there, there's a line that this is one of the ones that I didn't highlight about like his that being his first encounter with breasts but it's like left ambiguous in the sense that like is is she just kind of like hugging him or is there something w more uh, weird going on but anyway here's the one that that I that I did note um and Let's see, here we go. Uh, he understood from this and from the image of the yellow-green fabric that he had been embraced as a child, perhaps warmly and often, by his youngest aunt, she who had once tried to live as a nun in a building of several stories. we got to talk about the several stories buildings, too, because that's a, another uh, obsession that he has. Yeah. has um, stra uh, da -da -da. Strangely, so it seemed to him later, he was visited in the upper room by no image of either of his parents. He had never had reason for supposing that his parents were lacking in affection for him, and yet he had met up with no image of either parent among the images that had come into his view when he had seen into his essence, as he might have called it. Um, yeah, that's not very strong evidence, I grant. But it, that comes at the end, and I feel like there's a few other passages where he talks about these weird, semi-sexual, from his perspective, situations that he was in with the ant. Uh, so, I don't know. I feel like you need to gather more evidence. That's my. That's my. That's my. That's my own my fan head. fiction. That's my own fan fiction. <laughs> it also feels like he would have Hot just related boobs. it. Yeah, I get it. it. It also feels like something he would have just related uh, factually if it were to have happened. See, that's the thing, though. That's where I'm not sure because a he talks about um, in this book that he doesn't write about sex explicitly ever. The narrator talks about that. Um, and I think Bernane has talked about that in, in the interviews and stuff. Yeah, the, but there's the an talk. orgy and he talks about masturbating. I, I, that's I true. Yeah. No, that's true. So another performative contradiction, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but uh, the other reason is that, you know, thinking about the and, and we don't have to stay on uh, <laughs> incest and We're molestation so for too game. long. I know. No, I know. But but the other thing is, right, like it may because he's reporting the <laughs> contents of his mind and his phenomenology of it. It may have been not experienced by him as 
like an assault or whatever, which is often True. the case, especially for young people, especially for men who are are assaulted by older people, especially women, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it could be the case that that it's it wasn't reported as explicitly because that's not how it was f- subjectively experienced. Would be my roundabout. I think you're onto something. Yeah, I'll buy that, especially with a large Catholic conservative family in that time period. Like, right. Yeah, there, there there was probably some a frisson or two and some <laughs> funky goings on, you know. Uh, but yeah, it's confused well, by the fact that it's 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 his recollections and and he is the he is the agent, I guess, uh, um, without exclusion, really. Well, well, what what I find fascinating about this too is that he doesn't just remember his, his aunts, but his aunts get. Uh, combined with these fictional characters that he's read about. Um, uh, most specifically, um, he, he talks about um, this book, Brat Farrer, in the beginning yeah, parts mm. of, of this book, yeah. um, which Red I'm Farf. not familiar with at all. Brat yeah. Farrer. But, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he talks about how he can't even remember his own aunt's face. What he remembers of his aunt is the face of this fictional character whose face that he made up. Right. Um, but there is this moment um, to back up uh, Gabe's theory on, on page 45 where he, he like imagines his aunt and this aunt to be character from this book that he read. Um, and then he starts, t- it, it, this is when he starts doing um, what, what Paul was, was criticizing earlier of, of like combining two words and calling, you know, using a like girl cousin image aunt. Um, but he talks about how, um, he wanders among along among these uh, image landscapes in this image world, um, and then in the same sense, uh, and, and his aunt's there, and then he t- starts talking about how he masturbated often. So, I mean, whether something happened to him or in some Freudian way, I know uh, you know, Murnane would hate bringing up Freud because yeah. uh, he, he hates the, the idea of the drops. subconscious. Yeah, yeah. but. Uh, it might be a, a way in which he 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 wanted something to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, he seems to have, have lusted after his, his aunts um, in the same way that he lusted after these other fictional women that are in his mind. And in his mind, they all kind of mix together. Yes, mm-hmm. and I'm, the, I'm pounding was... the gavel on this one. <laughs> well, I, I <laughs> no, just, I'm kidding. I just I'm wonder. Kidding. I just wonder if Judge he was Gabe. just he was just beating off, and yeah. it wasn't assault, but more just like that kind of like shameful. Yeah like incest right. adjacent kind of imaginative which is would would dovetail with everything that we're talking you know what i mean like yes like this is real and it's not like this is crossing a moral court sort of line for me and it's also it didn't really happen but it kind of did yeah right <laughs> yeah i, I also uh, i also wanted to just flag like it was I, I had so many like moments like this you mentioned that that he would be uh, resistant to the psychoanalytic kind of Freudian, uh, uh, you know, th- read like reading it, yeah. or any literary theory you're sort of reading. But I'm just like, <laughs> it was just so funny to me to, for him to drop that in there. Like, I don't believe in any of that crap, that that absolute BS. And the whole book is just a tour of his subconscious. Like, the whole book is just yeah, like a, yeah. t- a tour of his, like, his own kind of, you know, mind at, at, at that level. And which but I, is so, I just think it's cheeky? so interesting. That's what Does I don't. He, that's what I don't know. I don't that's know. what I. I that's what I never know. That. Like Sean, do you have yeah. any any other interview stuff where he's like saying that aloud? I'm sorry, I, but you are no. the expert. You are the I read one expert other book. Here. <laughs> yeah, that's all um, it takes well, for no, us. No, well, no, because what, what was interesting too? Because I watched. Um, he gave this paper called "The Still Breathing Author" mm-hmm. at, at this conference that was held in his in his hometown in like 2017, um, which was. That whole conference just was fascinating. He was like one Great of the bartenders for, for the event. <laughs> um, it was a whole thing. But at one point in the paper, he just starts going through a list of things that he doesn't believe in. And he, he just says like, you know, um, oh. uh, uh, Freud is all hogwash. Uh, Darwin's theory of evolution is all bunk or, or whatever. Right? Yeah, that was a weird one. Um, Interesting. Yeah, bunk. but it, it's, I think you guys are right that it's just unclear if, um, if he's just messing with people. Because I, I, I do think that he has this kind of like whimsy. Um, I feel like he likes to mess with academics specifically because he almost kind of resents academics. Yes. Uh, because he mm-hmm. talks about how much he, he hates um, 
he hated the university system, which is why he never went into it. Um, it's, I don't know if he's messing with, with them or not, um, or if it's just kind of like a, a cop-out in a way of being able to explore the subconscious without having to read Freud. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember that moment, that, that, it's funny you bring that up, I remember that moment in that talk when he goes into the like, Darwin, I don't believe in that. Like, and the audience is laughing at that moment, right? right? The yeah. audience starts chuckling. Uh, awkwardly because they don't really know yeah. like that's the well, thing yeah, it's, it's hard the, to tell if he's being earnest or not and I think that's true with a lot of the stuff in this in this book yeah it's like unclear if they're laughing at him because he's like a dotering you know like like a, a grandfather right like when your grandfather or something like that just starts going off on stuff you just kind of laugh along or if they're in on the joke or, or, or what I, I don't know yeah it was definitely a weird moment or he could just have such, like, it seems to me more like he could have such a specific idea of what that means or the implications of that as well. Because, like, w this book, again, I I did find it to be overwhelmingly a, a fairly boring read. That's about the best I'm going to be able to say. Uh, oh, it was the most boring book I've ever read in my entire life. <laughs> but, <laughs> there it is. But, I, but what, I, what I expected and what's happening is that the discussion around it is... is is interesting me and like it, it it was something i have never experienced and i do think that he's kind of like what is it like sui generis like he because of his isolation and what and whatnot and his own like kind of uh you know unique perspectives on some issues that are obviously and, and ideas that are like old and well trod but like he might not have been as familiar as quickly with them there is this like bizarre very personal and unique perspective that he brings to to these questions. He's like a he's like a literary like lost tribe that's had like no <laughs> contact with the outside world and has just developed its <laughs> own like completely like you said sui generis approaches. He's an outsider yeah, I, artist. I, I, <laughs> kind of. I think there's like a, a a part of him that's correct in this though. Because the like the, the idea of psychoanalysis is and the idea with like most theory and I don't really like most theory I don't really like uh, uh, psycho um, analysis but the idea of it is you can take this this almost um, almost objective theory and apply it to these subjective instances and these subject these subjective uh, experiences and then you read that experience through that lens and it seems to me that Murnane's entire point in this book is that what goes on in his mind is sui generis it's utterly unique and in the mind of every single individual it is individually unique so the idea of taking a broad theory like freud or lacan or whatever or a theorist and then applying it to him i think in his mind i think he might be genuine in saying why why would that apply to me what's going on in my mind's eye in, in you know what he calls um, for convenience his mind as he says because he even doesn't like that word <laughs> it isn't what it, other people are experiencing it is unique yeah I think that I think you're right that that's kind of his feeling on the issue and why right he's pretty like strong hard like like this is doing violence to me basically like, to, <laughs> yeah to exactly. say that like you whether can he's right or you can wrong. probe into me and like a and be correct. Right. I, yeah, I think I walked away from this experience thinking that like <clears throat> I did think it was unique, but I, I I walked away thinking like just because something is unique doesn't mean it's interesting. That's true. <laughs> you know. No, that's true. <laughs> doesn't mean I have you know you know what I mean. I, I'm not I, saying that like any of any of what any of you guys are saying like I, I there are interesting aspects of it, but I, I think his, like his, his like persona comes across as like very dull to me, and I I do actually do I actually do like a lot of psychoanalysis ways of thinking. I'm not like a, I'm not like a diehard person like that, or, but I, I, it does interest me. So I always think about those sorts of things in terms of my own thinking. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, it's just like, I almost feel like you're missing out when you're not re like reflecting off of thinkers like that. Mm -hmm. So for someone to just be like blatantly, like I don't buy into any of that. I just feel like you're not learning them about yourself and maybe some ways that you could potentially. I, I, I 
I, I have some more stuff to say about the psychoanalysis thing because I think there's another performative contradiction going on here, but I'll save it for the Patreon because we're coming up on, rapidly on an hour here. Are we um, really? Yeah, we're at 50, 49 minutes. Um, what a riveting conversation. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, but, but I do, do want to say that, you know, I think that with this approach, this just kind of raw reportage of phenomenology and individual, like you said, Sean, like fully individual, fully unique, sui generis experiences. Um, and, you know, it's sort of the, 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 the central issue maybe for me with this book was that it's sort of a tracing of Murnane's own meaning making process, right? And that's, as, as you sort of suggested early on, um, now whether that winds up anywhere, <laughs> separate question, but uh, that is interesting at some level in and of itself, sure. But in terms of like meaning for a reader, it seems because it's so unique to him, because it's just here's the content of my experiences, any meaning or insight that c could possibly be gleaned by a reader, it seems to me is going to be mostly like entirely accidental. Like it's, it's, it, do you relate to this experience that he had or do you, did you find insight in this passage about, so, like it's not, it's not, it's not, um, constructed in a way that that can elicit it reliably from other unique individuals who are going to be reading it right and there's almost like and, a and the question becomes solipsism like, right and the question becomes like what is the point of that uh, other than just a document of one guy's internal thought processes which and maybe that's enough maybe that's enough of a point but i i think it's an open question at least it is to me well do you think that um you know the, the specifics of this aren't relatable by like by nature by necessity we didn't live his life so they, they they cannot be relatable but the general idea of it i found to be quite appealing at different times there's one moment uh right and kind of in the middle of the book where he is talking about reading proust and this the scene at the end of um, i think the the the, se the seventh book that sticks out to him but he reports this scene of him reading it and goes into detail of like how he was standing and where he was. And then he says, um, you know, what happened afterwards is reported in the relevant passage in the last volume of the work of fiction, that English title of which is Remembrance of Things Past. But everything that he spoke about before mentioning the title is what happens in the book. But in Barley Patch, the narrator relates it as if it happened to him. So this, this, and I, I find this idea to be um, quite relatable in that when you read books, you often put yourself into the fiction and your own experiences. I mean, I don't, I can't think of a specific example right now, but like, surely I, ha I have memories that aren't my memories. I watched it on TV or something or read it in a book. And then I associated that with myself so much so that the boundary between, between what I just read and my own experiences doesn't exist. I have in any I have memories of way. being in Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> that's pretty dope. I'm joking. That's pretty sick. <laughs> but yeah, that's the kind of thing, right? Like when you're like, and again, it goes back to the this 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 almost like we've been. I know I'm I'm memeing now, obviously, but it goes back to this like like we've been saying like childlike thing almost mm. like True. where you just you want to insert yourself into the this cool fucking world and like be among these. Dope characters that you like. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's I, interesting I to, that is to hear you, you, Sean, say that like he comes across as childlike in interviews too. It's kind of like a interesting characterization of the author to like bring up those kind of childlike themes, but also come across as kind of childlike in his old age too. Hmm. There's well, a I, glimmer I, in his eye. There's a glimmer. I just find him <laughs> so like so innocent, um, like. I don't know this this idea of not being able to um, tell a story and just have the the facts of the story guide that, but to have this fictionality around that story. That's just that's how people tell stories. That's how, in my mind, when I remember you know going to Disney World when I was a kid, I had a pretty sick childhood. Uh, you know, sweet, I, sweet. I I remember <laughs> just. I went once uh, when I was nine. It was great. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, great. Um, but like, I remember stuff that clearly didn't happen, right? I yeah. have created my own narrative around that. Um, 
and I, I yeah, I find something. Um, I think childish is the right word, and I don't mean to be like diminutizing by saying that. No, because um, no. it, it seems like that's no, kind yeah. of. I think he likes that. <laughs> um, but I think he's also describing a, a a complication in his old age that like engendered the crisis. Like I, I think like um. You know, when I think when I have memories of my childhood, like at this point now, a lot of those memories are me remembering fondly what I used to be able to do, like in my memory. Like, you know what I mean? Like uh, it's the nature of remembering and like kind of the palimpsest of memory, like, you know, onion layering over itself. And and, and it feels like that's what's causing him to like have problems because he talks about how he can't remember like books at all that he's read yeah. he's like i've read thousands of books i don't remember a fucking line yeah but at the same <laughs> but at the same time and this that's relatable and at the same time yeah uh he's talking about things like proust or the bronte sisters or uh he's talking about francis yates at the end mm -hmm. and like which are, you know her famous book the art of memory um and, and he's talking about the uh yeah the profound impact in which he is like a ghostly figure inhabiting those worlds and like remembering that experience and like latching on to certain found phrases which is another thing that i thought was we didn't talk about but was like pretty beautifully rendered in the book like certain phrases just sitting in your head and like being evocative for years and like kind of being environments in their own right almost like the phrase glass slippers or whatever he's saying before like uh you know, really beautiful stuff like that. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it's, he, he's not, it, the innocence is obviously, that is being lost and that it seems like that's also what he's basically grappling with in a way as well. Yeah, and I, 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 I think he's, you mentioned that like, you know, he says he's read like a thousand books but only remembers like 11 of them mm -hmm. um, or, yeah. or something like that. And he <laughs> also talks about how like there, since he's turned whatever, like 50 or so, He's only like read the same five authors over and over again, um, and that again, I don't want I don't mean to keep going back to this, but that, that reminds me so much of a child, right? Mm -hmm. A child has like two favorite books, and they read that over and over again. Harry but Potter and Harry Potter. Oh, <laughs> Harry Potter one through seven. <laughs> there's there's something like really admirable about that though, of, of just constantly redoing that, and that's kind of what he does with these memories, is that he just constantly keeps remembering and reliving through his remembering these memories. He doesn't need new ones to get anything new out of them. He just needs the same old ones and to keep reliving them. And every time he does that, something new comes out of that, right? Like something becomes uh, unearthed or revealed. And I, I feel like that's that's what good readers do as well, right? In it's almost as if books. there was something in the, uh, in the, what's the term I'm looking for? Unconscious. That was there before. <laughs> that would be really <laughs> kidding. helpful. Kidding. But, but, Game but Loki heated about Freud hate. As well. <laughs> Slightly. I, I'm, no, I'm high key. I'm high key hated about <laughs> high it. High key hated. Yeah. Um, but, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that I think that in terms of like the central question of the book, right? Why, why, like, do, must I write? Why did I take this break? Why am I coming back? I think that that speaks to what you just said, Sean, really speaks to answering that question. Because I think, you know, the, the message of this book, at least, is like, at the beginning, Renan was sort of says, or the narrator, I, you know, whatever, function, you know, that's functionally the same thing, um, you know, says like, I, I, my view was that I had said everything that I could possibly say. All, all of the like relevant uh, thoughts that I have had in my head are already written. So why, why keep writing, right? Like it's done. Um, but then I think that, that what this book is sort of expressing is that the revelation that you just laid out, which is that even if it's the same memory over and over again, or the same image or the same, whatever, it never, it's never, it's inexhaustible, right? It's never fully done expressing itself or connecting itself, rearranging the structure of your memories and th having them connect differently, uh, over time. Like that, that process is, is infinitely iterative. Well, and he, he, he references Giordino Bruno at the end and stuff, mm -hmm. too. And, and, you know, that sort of al al uh, alchem or like hermetic philo philosophical idea of like, uh, you know, we are unlocking the infinite within us. Mm. Uh, you know, we're like God creatures. And it feels like that's where his Catholicism kind of goes too, right? Like we're, we're <laughs> like my brain is a galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, the meme yeah. to use a meme. Like yeah. it's like... Yeah, like my the, literal my, galaxy <laughs> brain. Yeah, so like, is the bonobos though, and like uh, evolution's real. 
<laughs> yeah. Christopher Hitchens in the, in the building. Uh, but no, right? Like the house, he, he builds a mind palace. This is these references to these houses. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of like the central structure of like his lived experience. And then he, he talks about the like plane and the trees at the edge. And that's, you know, kind of the edges of the known and the edges of the imaginative world. And yeah. like, he's obsessed. He's obsessed with the horizon lines and like, you know, the, the, those places beyond that are inexhaustible. Well, we're going to, I do want to talk about that. Yeah, Sean. And then uh, we'll uh, Final start, start to wrap up. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say that um, just to go off of what you two were just saying, um, that, that, ex- that experience of, or that process of remembering something and then retelling it and getting something new out of it is kind of built into the structure of this book that we have this right. part one, which is significantly longer in which he's just relaying all these memories. And then in part two, he kind of st- takes a step back and he starts talking about the the character, the narrator, as the chief character. So he kind of fictionalizes his fictions by taking another step backwards. Yes. Um, and then that is where, as Matt was saying, that's where he constructs his memory palace, that he creates then this building from which he can look into these memories and gaze upon them for eternity or something. I don't know. Just don't let it become the house of leaves. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. Well, as as you can, I'm sure, tell, we have a lot more to talk about. Uh, the discussion will continue on the uh, Patreon segment of the show, which if you would like to get in on that, uh, patreon.com slash find crakers that's right yeah pierce the veil for only two bucks a month um so yeah yeah we i mean i want to talk more about the the landscape imagery personally i think that's really the horizon thing matt um i'm going to talk about derrida so fair warning uh that's all go good. go take a shot of something if you need to on the break um but yeah so that's all going to happen after the jump uh but before that we have a few to, things to take care of i think we agreed beforehand this book does not lend itself to the harry potter <laughs> house sorting no, house active, no. segment <laughs> actively hostile to the sorting hat <laughs> um does it all, lend itself to any other sorting of any kind all of the girl cousins would be in whatever wow. the hot people house is uh, <laughs> yeah. Hufflepuff, apparently Hufflepuff. and the aunts <laughs> and the aunts yeah um uh, but yeah not not a really uh a felicitous uh, book for that for that particular segment so we're gonna we've elected to skip it and we're just going to go into the scrabble word segment so this is where we each pick a word from the book we just read that was either new to us or um a good scrabble word or we found just interesting for whatever reason uh who's got theirs? i'll go first all right go ahead paul my, I told you before we started recording that mine was Harry Potter related. Oh, right. Um, this was a, a and it, brain teaser. Thank God. I'm surprised you guys didn't there. pick up on it. It's not the way you spell it in the in the movie, um, but it's Patronus, <laughs> which is a Damn. female patron, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> oh, fuck you. Wait, that's oh, so that's funny. Good. That's good. That's good. I, I, I actually like totally good. missed that. Where is that in the book, Paul? Do you have the page? Um, I actually, no, but it's I, it's I like might. maybe like five or six pages. Like he uses the word over and over again. Oh, oh, pa- I, oh, I see, patroness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, patroness. Yes, one thirty. <laughs> okay, that's good. I was pronouncing it patronus because it's more fun. <laughs> it, yeah, because it's Harry Potter. <laughs> no, the bit had to land. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, Matt, you got one. Yeah, mine is. Um, it, it's one that I I knew, but I I I I think it's a pretty like de-scrabble word. And it's plover. Ooh, yeah, bird, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, P L O V E R. Any any numerous species of plump-breasted birds of the shorebird family Charadridae, wading birds. I love that. Long legs, short necks, straight bills. Yep. Wow, that's how I like my women. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Long uh. legs, short bills. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um. Here I got. Here's mine. I had a couple, but. This is this is the one that I'm going with. Uh, it's I don't and I don't even know how to pronounce it. Chasuble, chasuble. C- I underlined C- this one too. C H A S U B L E. Apparently, it's some type of Catholic like religious garb, like some type of cloak, a uh, specific type of cloak. I think it might be chasuble. I, I, chasuble, not... yeah, maybe. Eh, that's uh, my guess. Let's 
Let's. I don't, I'm not gonna bother looking up the. Can you click the but... audio? The guy that no. goes chas- chasuble. <laughs> no, because those are, those are, those aren't even reliable. True. Um. Yeah. A sleeveless outer vestment worn by a Catholic or high Anglican priest when celebrating mass, typically ornate and having a simple hole for the head. <laughs> Sweet. A simple hole for the head. I don't like that. Love in, it. A Catholic, yeah, in a Catholic, Catholic in Catholic terminology, I just don't like that in the, in the definition. <laughs> Jesus. Uh. All right, Sean, and do you have one? I, yeah, I had a few, and a lot of them were like the um, like the Catholic uh, words that mm-hmm. I haven't come across. But my word is personage or personage, um, just because I mean it's used a thousand times in this book. Um, yeah. But I mean, I've come across the word before, but not in the way that he uses it. And I find it so funny the way that he uses it because he uses it kind of out of reluctance. I think the first time he uses it is actually when he's introducing the the patronus, the, the patronus. Yes. Uh, but he talks about how he's only using the word for want of a more ac- accurate word. And occasionally he uses it to just mean person, but most of the time he uses it to mean like a fictional character. Mm-hmm. But occasionally he'll even go one step further to use it as a uh, to describe a more fictional character um, like there are like mm. layers of fictional characters in this book um, and I just find the way he uses that word because um, you know I, I looked it up and it goes back to you know like the middle French and it just means like a parson in a church and then it's slowly mm. expanded um, to indicate like you know um, the dramatist personae of a, of a theater production these characters um, I just found it to be a word that he uses so many times and every time it's a little bit different uh, yeah, etymology almost works. Yeah, I like the amalgamation between like, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Matt. No, that's all. I was gonna say I like I like the amalgamation he uses that word in particular for of just combining like the fictional characters with like potentially real characters, even though the, the whole book is potentially a work of fiction. It, it kind of reminded me of the Confidence Man, actually, mm. just like the use of confidence over and over again. Because it's it's almost like uh, within fiction you can end up creating a new definition for the word if you use it in a certain way over and over yeah it's one of those it's one of the classic just like repeat a word over and over again and it starts to like change meaning and lose meaning Mm -hmm. and get warped uh yeah yeah all right sweet so there's only one thing left to do everybody score this this bad boy yeah dibs not first i'll go first yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Sean, yeah, are, you I mean, for, are you familiar with our scoring system, by the way? Yeah, it's just uh, out of five. Yeah, yeah one through five. One, cool. one in around there being your life is actively worse for having read this book. Uh, you, you wish you could go back in time and not having read it. Two, the two range being sort of not, not, not great, but whatever. Three, good. Four, very good. Five, life-changing, etc. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't really... I don't really go after this style of fiction writing overall or just like with any media overall, just like, you know, um, talking within itself, it just kind of becomes boring to me. So that right off the bat kind of sets it back for me. Um, In terms of like other fiction books we've read in this genre, I do think I liked it more than the Calvino one. I think it actually asked better questions. It was more personal. Uh, The Calvino kind of felt a little too like, Hollywood almost to me like a little a lot of like a little too flashy a lot of this one f- yeah this one felt a little like it, it had a lot of honesty to it and there's a, there's a certain passages that I thought were just like really well written and the lucidity of the writing was very gorgeous in some moments um, but that being said I said it early in the episode it was like a fuck it was like walking through mud it was a the most boring reading experience, like one of the most boring experiences I've ever had. Um, maybe that, that relates to my ADHD mindset of just not being able to pay attention. This one really was a test for me. Um, I mean, I think one of the, we didn't really talk about it. One of the biggest detriments I had was that like he kept stating over and over again, this was like a, a work of fiction. It was a work of fiction and I'm going to write 30 pay- paragraphs and this is, but this is fiction. I feel like the disconnect to that was pretty high for me in terms of like I I saw it as such an autobiographical thing that I didn't believe him when he told me that it was fiction. And I I just you know maybe that's part of what he was trying to do, but it, it it like it always it almost felt like I was 
fading out certain aspects of the book because I knew they weren't real and then fading in for the ones that I felt were were actually mm. true. Yeah. Um, so I think that has to bring my score down a bit because I feel like what he was potentially trying to do was not coming across, you know. But uh, I I can't score it too low because I, I feel like it is a work of art. I really do. You know, I feel like he was being truthful to himself. So I'm going to give it a two point seven. Nice. All right. I'm, I'll go next. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I said earlier, I, I, I will echo Paul in the sense that I am I'm, I'm, I'm at this point in my reading career starting to get a little sick of the like meta books about books, books about writing, books about, you know, just it, it, it or, or at the very least, I'm at a place where it takes a special justification to to do that anymore. It's just it's just it just feels a little bit rammed into the like wall at this point, like beating a dead horse, if you will. Um, and also like, you know, I prefer my you know I'm a my background's in philosophy. I prefer just like literary theory for those sorts of questions, generally speaking. Um, and also, I'm mad that Mernan is a hater. Um, <laughs> Matt was Matt was Matt was not wrong, uh, but 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 yeah no I mean I, I said earlier that the whatever meaning anyone gets out of this book is gonna be mostly like randomized because it's there's no you know because because it is such a just reporting of of one person's own kind of processes of meaning and the images that are meaningful to him. Um, whether or not any of them are meaningful to you as a reader is going to be unpredictable. Um, and it, it, and for me, it turned out that mo it mostly was not. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that as Matt said earlier that I, I've, I, I'm, I feel like the discussion is more interesting than the actual text. Um, all the stuff that, that, that we've sort of been getting after Uh yeah, so I it it, it, it was not I, I don't I can't say it was an enjoyable experience. I think it raises some interesting questions. I don't think it deals with those questions particularly adroitly, um, but that's just me. So I actually am at like a two point eight as well. Yeah, nice. So pretty similar, Paul. Want to go? Want to guess? Go last, or you guys can. Yeah, you guys duke rock, it out. Rock, paper, scissors. I can go. I can go. That's fine. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. You... Yeah, I, I'll go. Um, I, I find, I mean, this is a difficult book to rate, I think. Um, I think given what Murnane is doing with this book and given um, the autobiographical details around this, it makes this book, I think, dependent upon his earlier bibliography, which you could critique, I, I think, and a book shouldn't necessarily be so referential to what he what he wrote earlier. But I think if I've read his earlier works before this, I think I would have appreciated it more. But I agree. That being said, I think I had a much uh, higher view of this book. I I, I think than uh, either Gabe or Paul so far, um, because I think this book is really unlike anything else I've ever read. That doesn't necessarily mean it's good, but I think it explores the act of reading and writing in such a unique way. And I think he explores this invisible world of his fictionality, um, this memory palace, um, and gives us like this really interesting tour of his own palace. I mean, at times I felt like, to make the obvious reference, um, I'm a medievalist, uh, I felt like Dante being led by, by Virgil. I mean, mm, you're in I hell. had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea like what I was being led into and what I was looking at. And a part of it, you know, I kind of felt, um, as you kind of do with the kind of auto fiction, you kind of feel like you're not supposed to be looking at times. But mm. what I like so much about this book is I found that it's dismissal of reality or facts in favor of fiction to just be admirable. And perhaps not even a dismissal of reality or dismissal of facts, but the necessity of fiction to extend those facts. To extend that reality, I think it just elevates the fictional world in in some interesting ways. Um, though, 
it is overly navel gazing, which I'm not necessarily against. I, I think, I mean, if the, the, the navel is interesting and the gazer can, can see some interesting <laughs> things interesting. in that nasal, in that navel, Damn, I'm fine with it. Here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's a cool, uh, if it's a cool, if it's a cool uh, navel, Weirdly I'm all deep. about gazing at it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also think that the sentence level writing, I think in this is, is pretty in, impeccable. Um, I, I think the way he's able to deliver an image from his mind into your mind, the point of the point of the image, I don't know, but the way he's able to implant that image in my mind, I think it's something uh, quite admirable. Uh, I think it's quite good. So yeah, I can see why a reader would despise this book. Um, but again, I kind of <laughs> like books that are solipsistic and nasal gazing. Um, and I found it to be a joy to read, actually, if at times difficult to comprehend. So I'm giving it a 3.8. Nice. Fuck yeah. Yeah, nice. we didn't really talk about the the writing that much, so maybe we should get into that. Some, no, I do uh, want to because what show. what Sean just said, I like I agree with like so much too, and I'm I, I want to like kind of decipher my thoughts about why it didn't work for me, even though I thought it was such a high level. Um, Patreon, but, baby. but yeah, respect. I love disagreeing. This is what this is what podcast profitable are discourse. All about. Dude. <laughs> I, yeah. Profitable discourse, baby. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah. Just to get it right out of the gate, I do, I do kind of, I, I, I do kind of fall in line more with with my co-hosts because we're becoming a hive mind. Uh, <laughs> where there is like this profound, almost d deep respect for the project here and, and like the attempt and like what Mernane is doing, while also basically deeply uh, not enjoying. Uh, it on a sentence by sentence basis, even the impeccable sentences that they are, even the you know grammatically and syntactically complex that they are, you know, I, I, when I when I picked this up, I I didn't expect this to be in the Calvino mode of interrogating writing or metafiction or whatever. I thought this was going to be literally a writer discussing their writing. I thought it was going to be autobiographical right from the jump, and that it was going to just be this sort of exploration of, of personal details about like why this doesn't work and like uh, whatever. Um, but yeah, th th there is a, you know, uh, charmingly naive solipsism that overall, yeah, I don't know. It's like Gabe said, it, it's kind of randomized who's going to find the meaning there. Like Mernane is a incre incredibly obsessive person, it seems, based in like his sort of interviews and and how he went about doing this. Um, and I think the discussion being good is at points in its favor, honestly. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of have to abstractly give it like a three. Okay. Nice. I love that for you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, Sean, you also have at least an abstract three. I love it. Abstract three. <laughs> I don't know yeah. how to put it. The, the floating three. <laughs> the platonic three. I don't yeah. know. It's like, yeah. I could kiss It's the like three. that Jim Carrey movie. Like my aunt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. All right. Well, um, that wraps this uh, episode up for now. Um, again, the Patreon uh, segment. We'll continue the discussion. Sean, thank you so much for your time. Tell the people yeah, where... Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for coming. Tell the people where yeah. they can find you. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on. Um, it's just uh, YouTube, uh, Travel Through Stories on Instagram and Twitter. I think it's just Travel Through Stories YT um, because I spent about a minute thinking of a name for my channel. <laughs> so. does, it, does, it, does, it come, does it come from something specific? No. It Love just that. comes with yeah. I I just I couldn't think of anything and I just made it. That's awesome. <laughs> your imagination. <laughs> it came from your imagination. Oh, yeah. yeah imagination. <laughs> well, Ooh. thanks so much again, and uh, thanks everyone for listening, and we hope to see you uh, soon. Or bye bye. Have you listened? Or on the Patreon <laughs> segment because we're gonna get into more details about what's going on. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone. See ya. Later. Bye. Bye.